Our scripture reading this morning is from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia, in Pontus and in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What means this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is what which I'm sorry, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord has come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God's word for the people of God. Amen. So as we head into this summer, I am happy to say that I am starting my third year of appointment here as the pastor. Thank you. Uh, some of you might be thinking, wow, this is the third year already. Some of you might be thinking, oh no, another year of this guy. However, I wanted to bring that up as the first part of my sermon today because the sermon today, in the beginning, I'm going to harken back to the first sermon that I ever gave when I was officially appointed to the church. And I know that you all have hung on every word that I've said over the past two years, and so it'll be very familiar to you, right? But in my first sermon, the question that I asked was really of myself, and it was this, what kind of pastor should I be? And in the end of my examination, I came to the conclusion that I can only be myself. But I did make a promise to you all, one that I have tried to faithfully keep each week while I'm in the pulpit, and it is this. I promise to be honest with you, honest about what I was feeling, honest about what I was discerning from God each week. And I promise that I would do that to my very best ability to fulfill part of my calling. Now it is in that spirit that I need to tell you all something this morning. As many of you know, this past week was annual conference. And I was in Hershey to attend to the business of the conference these uh, for three days this week. 
And I have to tell you, in the spirit of being honest, it was absolutely dreading going to annual conference. I had been to two previous conferences, but due to COVID, they were online. And I was able to attend them in the privacy of our office. And when I was done for the day, I was already at home. This year, however, we were able to meet in person. And while it seemed like everyone else that I knew in the pastoral world was excited to go and meet together, I was not. You see, I have become a bit of a homebody as I've gotten older. I find that at the end of the day, all I really want to do is just sit in my chair and be with my family. And the prospect of going and sitting in a large auditorium all day and then having to stay overnight away from the majority of my family was not one that I was looking forward to doing. Now, if you've, ever, if you've never been to annual conference or if you've never watched annual conference online, there is a great deal of procedural work that gets done at conference. We vote on things like the budget for the conference and to accept different plans for each of the commu committees that are being put forth. There are resolutions that come forward as well that we vote upon. And see, there are people that absolutely love this part of annual conference. They love to stand up and remind the bishop of the procedural rules that must be followed according to the discipline in paragraph four. I must remind you, bishop, we are all to use a red pin to vote no and a blue pin to vote yes. And since we were all using black pins, we need to throw this vote out and begin again. Also, I was reading last night, Bishop, that if your left shoe was untied, and I noticed that it was this morning, that all votes are null and void, and anyone with the last name L, starting with L, has lost the privilege of voting now. Now, I made those two things up. They are not actual procedures, but you get the idea. There are people that will be that precise in what we are doing, and it is good because we need people like that. But for me... I think we have established my uh, loathing of paperwork and what I feel are unnecessary rules at times. I struggle to accept them. And so again, I must admit I was not looking forward to annual conference. But by the end of the first night, I found myself enjoying the experience. You see, I had forgotten about the other part of annual conference. And that is a time that we spend together worshiping, singing, praying, and listening to sermons. Now, since I've taken on my calling as a pastor, I've not had the opportunity to simply be in worship on a regular basis. Oh, I'm here every week, right? But I am not worshiping the same way that you are. And what I have found is that this week, I was truly missing that part of my life, and I was reminded of that. I had forgotten how the Holy Spirit can move among you when you are in worship. And I have come back from conference feeling renewed and hoping to approach our work in this world with new vigor. Now, if you are a regular attendee of services here, you probably may be thinking at this point, hey, this is not how sermons by Pastor Eric go. He's supposed to talk about our verse. Then he's going to tell us how he thinks it applies to our lives. And then he's probably going to tell us a story about how it's affected his life. Things are all out of order this week. Well, you would be correct. Because the theme of annual conference this year was, Behold, I am doing a new thing. So in that spirit, I am attempting to preach a sermon that is a bit different, at least in order from what I would normally do each week. But when we hear this idea of doing a new thing, some of us begin to worry. I don't want to do a new thing. I like things the way they are. Oh boy, what is the pastor? The pastor wants to do new things. What is he going to get us into? See, the truth is most of us don't like change. We like things the way we have always done them. And to accept that we might need to change something means that we have to admit to ourselves that perhaps what we have been doing is not the right way of doing it 
or the best way of doing it. And again, I was certainly there this week. I did not want to change having conference online. I had really grown to like doing it that way. But some of us do get excited at the prospect of change. Some of us think, oh, thank the Lord, he is finally listening. I have been saying things need to change around here forever. Now, more than likely, we find ourselves a little bit in both camps. Things do need to change, but I doubt that there is anything that we can do to change them. We've tried so many other things before in the past. Why would something new change the outcome this time? Well, brothers and sisters, that brings us to the scripture for today. You see, today is the day that we celebrate Pentecost in the church, the birth day of the church. It is the day that we celebrate the Holy Spirit coming to us as a gift for God's people. We listen to the sermon that Peter gave and how all the people listening were able to hear it in their own language. And we remember how 3,000 people were added to the kingdom of heaven that day. Indeed, it is a good thing for us to celebrate this day. It's a good thing for us to thank God for sending the Holy Spirit to work amongst us. But I want you to think about this fact. You see, on that day of Pentecost, God could have easily said to the people, Behold, I am doing a new thing. I am sending the power of the Holy Spirit, and look what it can do. Now let's talk about that new thing. Was it well received by everyone when it came down? The answer is no. We can see how some people viewed the coming of the Holy Spirit to the apostles. They thought the men were drunk, accusing them of being drunk on sweet wine early in the morning as because of the way they were speaking. Now we that know the rest of that story can look back on those naysayers and wonder how could they have possibly been so wrong? How could they have missed the point that God was doing something new? How could they have been so blind to the possibilities that God was opening up by sending the Holy Spirit? Well, brothers and sisters, do we not do the same thing ourselves? Do we not look at the new things that God is doing and say, it will never work? Do we not look at those that are new to faith and downplay their fire saying, oh, just give them some time and they'll calm down. They can't be on fire for Christ like that much longer. Do we not look at our youth and say, wait until life beats them up some they will lose their innocence, or they will understand better when they are older that they just can't be so excited about Jesus all the time. Now, I just want to pause briefly here and tell you that if you are struggling with belief that the youth of this world want to be followers of Christ, you shouldn't be. This week at annual conference, it was about 10 young people uh, from ages 17 on down to 13 that attended as part of the youth conference. And each and every one of those young people were deeply invested in what was happening during conference. There was not bringing them back to pay attention. There was not yelling at them because they were running through the hallways and didn't want to be there. No, they were deeply, deeply involved with the sermons, with the worship, and even with the resolutions and procedural things that were done, some of them stood to speak to those resolutions. So do not worry about the youth. Let's continue to reach out to the youth. But we, ask, we say all these things, we doubt all these things, and I say we because I have been guilty of all those things as well. But it is well past time that we stop doing those things. When we find someone that is new to the faith, we should be rejoicing with them and building them up. When our youth are on fire for Christ, we have to do everything we can to stoke that fire. And most importantly, when God says, Behold, I am doing something new, we must put our faith firmly behind him and say, Where you lead, I will follow. Let us not find ourselves like those naysayers in Scripture today. Let us not look upon the new things God is doing and simply discredit them 
because we don't understand them. So now then, what new things is God going to do in this church? What has he been stirring inside your hearts? See, I want to know. I want to know what God has been calling you to do. Because I want to know how I can help you and support you in whatever area of ministry it is that you want to be a part of. I want to be there and I want to behold that new thing that God is going to do through you. And I will tell you that I have decided to begin two new things here at this church. They are things that have been stirring in my own heart. We are going to be praying more. I am intending to open the church on Wednesdays from 10 to 11 for prayer, beginning on June 15th. And I invite you or anyone you know that needs a quiet place to come and pray and reflect, to come to the church during those times. I invite you to bring anyone you know that needs prayer to the church at that time, and I or whoever will be here will pray with them and for them. Our other thing that we will be doing that is slightly new, and I think something that maybe we have forgotten about here in the church, we have a lovely prayer screen over there. And what we are going to do is we're going to move that prayer screen to the wall that is right here so that we can actually see it each and every week. And I invite you to write down the prayers that you have and also to write down the prayers that God has answered for you. And we're going to watch that thing fill up together. You'll notice today I cleaned off the side that says answered prayers. Not because it's not important that they were answered, because I want a starting point for us all to see how it's going to fill up together. And when those things are filled up, and when we feel the need to do so, we are going to testify as to the answers that God has given us to our prayers. And so today, since I had advanced knowledge of this, I'm going to be the one who puts the first paper back into the screen. And I'm going to tell you what I wrote here. So I had been praying long and hard night after night, day after day, for renewal of my spirit and discernment as to what and where we should be going as a church. And I believe God has answered those prayers for me this week, doing so at a place where I didn't even want to be, which is the amazing thing about God, how he can use anything to his ability if we let him. So we're going to work on doing this together. We're going to work on doing this because I believe that prayer is going to help us move forward. And we're going to watch how God can transform this world through that power of prayer. And we're going to behold as he does something new. And we're going to move into ministry even deeper to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And we're going to do all of this not through our power or in our name. We're going to do all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. And through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to trust God. The God that began all things once. Is going to do something new. And we're going to see how he can grow his church. Just like he did on the first day of Pentecost. So your challenge this week. Is already properly before you as we would say at annual conference. But just in case. I want you to ask God to do something new in your life and then take that opportunity when it comes before you. Amen.